I don't normally make videos like this on this channel, but I think this is a really important subject to talk about openly and honestly to hopefully arm composers with tools to be able to protect themselves from this situation in the future. Today, I was doing my social media rounds and I came across an article that Mick Gordon just released on Twitter about his experience working with Marty Stratton and the ID software team for the game Doom Eternal. This game has had huge critical acclaim. The soundtrack has had huge critical acclaim. And so it was really hard to hear his story and how terrible his working conditions were working on that soundtrack. In that article, Mick described a ton of terrible working conditions, music that was previously cut, be reused and re-implemented in the game without his consent and without being paid for it, delays not being communicated to, and then ultimately having some other music editor, music editor, co-credited on the album's release without his involvement. Uh, yeah, it's just a whole fiasco, a whole nightmare. Now, obviously we're just speaking from one person's words to another. Of course, like Marty, uh, the exec over at ID Software has denied this and Mick Gordon is saying that it has happened. So we're just working on people's words. But as a composer, I wanna ally myself with another composer. I wouldn't be surprised if all the things that Mick is saying in this article are true because I have heard of similar experiences from other composers, particularly those working in the game dev community. So first I'd like to talk about and explore why this is happening. This is happening everywhere in the entertainment industry, but I've seen it come up quite a few times now in the game dev community. I've experienced it on some minor scales, nothing like this, but to some small extent, and I have friends who have as well. My theory is that the game community is still relatively new compared to the film and the TV industry. So in the film industry, we've had this going on for almost 100 years, probably over 100 years now. So the practices of working with a composer and how the process goes and the timeline of produ production schedule is established. It's been established and tweaked and perfected for the most part. The game community, it's not like that. It's, it's much newer. And so I think that we're still kind of finding our footing when it comes to the timeline of who should be involved and when. As a result, I think that composers in particular are being brought on way too early in the production process. Uh, for some of these composers, these are year long endeavors, two year, three year, it can keep going. And it's problematic because you're asking a composer to be involved so early in the process that you're still implementing things. You don't know what's going to work, what's not going to work, if you have to change your creative vision, if you have to pitch things, and, and the process of creation is so much longer with games than it is with film or TV that it's really dangerous and risky to have a composer get involved that early. Having somebody write music for your game before it's even really fully fledged out means there could be possible rewrites, there's certainly gonna be revisions, things could get cut, and that's gonna create a lot of problems and tension for a composer. The other problem is simply time. You know, you're asking a composer to be involved in a project for a year plus, and in a lot of cases, the budget for these games, particularly like indie games, just don't pay enough for a composer to invest that amount of time. It's one thing for a game dev or the game's creator to be invested and wanna put, you know, 50, 60 hours a week into this game. That's fine and it's understandable because it, in some cases it might be their game. But to ask somebody who is a work for hire to then have that same passion and energy and drive and availability as you is just not fair because their risk to reward isn't proportionate. Unless they're getting 20% state claim in the game, you know, it just doesn't make sense for them to have a work for hire and be involved for years on end. Now, if you do have a composer in that early, or if the composer wants to be in that early, there's a different process you should go through. And Mick, even in his article, even talked about this. He suggested the idea of writing some themes. And that's a great idea because themes can be manipulated. You can figure out the heart of your story or your game, kind of work the theme, and then you can implement that theme into different settings. So it's a good way to make use of your time because you're finding those core ideas that you can then expand or tweak afterwards. Not committing to an environment queue where the environment's gonna be ditched or the entire landscape's gonna change or somebody higher up is gonna say, I don't wanna use it. The other problem that's happening in the game dev community is these precedents that are being laid down or that exist right now are being justified by saying, well, that's just the way it is. That's how the game dev community is. If you wanna be a composer for games, then you have to be expected to be on a project for a year or two years. You have to be expected to do a ton of revisions. That's just how it is. I mean, says who? Says who? These things can be changed, should be changed if they're not working for people. The idea that that's what you have to sign up for if you want to be a game composer, I think is completely unfounded and outrageous and I think needs to be changed. Now, this is where I think it takes a little bit of bravery as a creative person. 
Uh, I've come up against this personally in my own career, but we have to, as, a com- as composers, we have to stick up for ourselves. We have to establish the boundaries that we want to see exist in our industry. Mick stood up for himself when, after a year, he hadn't been paid and was asking to do rewrites. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. Pay me first. Unfortunately, the situation didn't resolve itself. Uh, which is too bad, but it's good to see him stick up for himself in that situation and say, enough is enough. Ways that I stick up for myself and the boundaries I create in my industry currently are I don't work weekends unless absolutely necessary, and if it's necessary, somebody should know I'm doing them a favor. I make sure that I'm paid up front some portion for projects as much as possible. You know, sometimes it doesn't always work out that way, but I'm not going to be strung along for multiple months on end working on a project where I haven't seen any money. If revisions need to be made over and over and over again, and we've passed some unholy amount of revisions, I'm gonna have a conversation about that. I'm gonna say, this isn't okay, we need to clarify our vision. And these things can be really difficult to do when you're working up a big ladder. You know, if you're just talking one-on-one to a creator, it can be very easy to have those conversations. But when you have, yeah, it's not my decision, yeah, it's not my decision, yeah, it's not my decision, it goes all the way up the chain. It's very easy for people to deflect that blame upwards. And then you don't know who to blame, and you don't know where the problem's coming from, and it's really, really messy. Now, I think objectively, as someone who is not in that situation, it's easy for me to look at Mick's situation and say, I would have been gone from that gig a long time ago. I would have quit that when things started turning sour. But the reality is there are a lot of factors and bias that come into play when we're working on a project as a creative person. You know, we get excited about the prospect of a game really doing well, a project doing well. We get excited about the prospect of whatever the pay may be, uh, the idea of building a relationship with somebody new or a big company. We get excited about the music that we're writing or have written. And in many cases, we are so entranced by the idea of this potential growth in our career that we begin to neglect our personal health, our mental health, our physical health, our relationships. We put those things aside because we say, yeah, but if I can just get through this, this is what's gonna make my career skyrocket and this is my rite of passage. For me, there is nothing more terrifying than the idea of getting exactly where I want it to be and having lost everything that I cared about in the process. It is my personal mission, personally and professionally, to make sure I protect the things that I care about on a day-to-day basis protect my relationship with my wife, protect my time, protect my ability to take my weekends off, protect my ability to get paid fairly, protect my mental health from countless revisions and headaches and the risk of potentially losing the passion for the thing that I love. I need to protect those things at all costs. Those are the things that will bring me through my career. There is no finish line to this career. You are doing this constantly. You have to make sure that you're enjoying what you're doing every day. You don't have to love it, but it shouldn't be hell on earth. And my heart goes out to Mick and his family and all the things he had to endure during this time. It's it's terrible and I can't imagine. And I want to make sure that I and other composers take this as a lesson to make sure you protect yourselves early from this stuff. Don't let it happen to you. It's just not worth it. This is a cool career, but it's not worth losing things you care about along the way. That's it. No, it's a different video than usual. Hope you got something useful out of it. Um, Hope you can show your support to Mick and his family. Uh, Hope the situation gets resolved for him because it's it sucks, and I'm sure he doesn't want to go on with it. His music's great, but it's it sucks that he had to deal with that. So that's it.